This last session is the experimental session um, in that we want to answer some of the questions that you posed to us beforehand, and maybe this will spark some questions and other discussion about points that weren't raised in the various talks. So you brought in, or you sent us 29 questions, and we've gone through these questions. Some of these questions have been answered, more or less, in the, in the presentations. And some of the other questions are of more technical nature that I think also been answered. So we've made a selection here, and we started off with um, a few topics. Um, Magdalena and I are going to run this session. Magdalena has more experience than me, and she says, you won't get through all the questions. You know, you'll have to make a selection. So we're going to do that. And we've reserved um, 15 minutes per topic. And so we hope, therefore, to cover, say, four or five topics during the time, maybe more. Um, so, we've also asked various of the instructors to say a few words about some of the particular topics. So, um, I've got a list of the topics on the, in fact, all the questions on the screen here. So, um, this is the first one that, I've, um, that we thought we'd start off with, and something that we can, um, Mario Lena and I can answer. So, this is a general question about, basically, how does one find more information about neuroinformatics? Now, I should say here that um, the course here has been organized by the INCF Training Committee, which has been running this course now for three or four years. And we are aware that getting neuroinformatics training is difficult. And really, I was just going to say something about the second question, how do you recommend it? What do you recommend in order to introduce myself to neuroinformatics? We take that to mean what background does one need to progress in neuroinformatics. <laughs> this has been touched upon in one or two of the talks already, but I think the most important thing is that if you are, say, somebody, well, if you have a specialist course, if there happens to be a course and you're a student and you're able to attend it on neuroinformatics, that's fine, but that's usually not the case. And you have to rely on short courses. There are a few short courses around the world, um, not many, um, and this is one of them. Um, if you are a physicist or a computer scientist, somebody working in the so-called quantitative sciences, what I re re would recommend is that you need to somehow get some knowledge of neuroscience. Um, you don't actually have to start, for example, um, sticking electrodes into brains, but you need to understand what it is to do neuroscience, what the constraints are when you are trying to analyze data that has come from a neuroscience background, because it's not easy. Modelers say, well, we, we just need this sort of data, and then we'll be able to model a particular thing. But it's not, this isn't as simple as that. Data is difficult to get. There are usually very important constraints why um, data is not available of the, of the type that you would really like. So you only get that experience by somehow getting yourself to visit lab, neuroscience labs or look at experiments or take part in experiments or whatever. So conversely, if you are a a somebody from the biological background, you need to have some experience in quantitative methods. It doesn't mean that you need to just be able to sort of um, use a computer, but you've got to understand how to take models or data analysis tools and apply this to your data. So you basically, the problem with neuroinformatics is that you have to be educated in these two areas together, and that's not usually very easy. So um, that's all I will say about this one. Um, Marianne, do you want to say something about the first question there? Um, I would like to also add to the second one. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe to give like a little mm -hmm. bit more practical hints. This was really great what David said, but like from the practical point of view, I would like to point out that if you are a biologist, uh, like what we typically do in my research group, if a molecular biologist or an electrophysiologist enters the group, they immediately start taking some math courses. Although it sounds a little bit tedious, but sometimes there are like uh, some good courses in mathematics uh, uh, departments, like more tools to uh, scientific computing. Uh, sorry. So to take courses uh, related to math that are, have some kind of like scientific computing aspect. And then secondly, it's always good to study a little bit physics more than at high school, because there you get the, the kind of perspective, what is it about with modeling and how it helps. And then if you come from a more quantitative background, like uh, engineering, 
uh, physics or computer science. Then what I did, for example, 20 years ago, I started reading through Kandel, which is really tedious, but I went it through in two years or so, like by myself. And then in addition to that, I, I went to some international courses, actually where you put your hands to work. So I actually did some electrode work. And I think it helps to appreciate also the, those who do the wet lab part. So this is kind of a back practical are advice. There Good. Are there some other inter, uh, short courses around the world? You mentioned there were a few, but not many. Are there any? I don't know, yeah? There's, let me see. Um, American people may know better than me. Woods Hole and Cold Spring Harbor mm -hmm. did have. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I would say that most of the courses that exist are like longer. They are two, three week courses where you have to propose a project and it's very competitive to get into those. So you would need to first, if you are a beginner in the fields, to go to this kind of courses like this INCF short course. And then there are some kind of like more local courses, like what I, for example, been running for the past two or three years, this Baltic Nordic summer school in neuroinformatics and computational neuroscience. So this we have kind of made an intention that we keep it on a, on a relatively low level so that it's, it can be attended by both biologists and computer scientists. So we kind of tuned it and keep it on a, on a level that can be attended. Um, I should add to that, there are two long courses in computational neuroscience. One is run, is, I think it's called the European uh, course. The, the, this is four weeks long. This is very competitive. It's run in various centers in Europe. The other one is run by, a similar nature is run in Okinawa. Okinawa where there's a big, um, it's in Japan, um, is a big um, <coughs> biological stroke physical sciences research campus there and they run another, I think it's four-week course in computational neuroscience. Both of these are very competitive mm -hmm. courses to get into. Um, Barry wants to add something to uh, there. Yeah, sure. At Woods Hole in the US, there were two courses. One was really methods in neuroinformatics. That course disappeared about uh, two years ago. Jonathan and I both used to go to that, uh, be faculty for that. Um, but the computational neuroscience course at Woods Hole, which I think was the first one ever, it started in 1982 or something like that, is still going. It takes 30 students a year, it's four weeks, and the competition to get into that is unbelievably fierce. Um, most of the people who get in actually have some experience already. The other thing I should add is that in particular areas of neuroinformatics, INCF does fund, does part fund courses of roughly a week's um, length. We have been funding one or two of these a year, um, we, which are in particular topics in neuroinformatics. I must say I don't actually know many, if any, introductory neuroinformatics courses like this particular one. Yeah, I just want to add um, regarding the European course and the Okinawa course, while there is competition, it shouldn't discourage anybody of you to actually try, yeah, so, <laughs> because it, it came, at least to me, it came across, okay, I don't even bother because it's so competitive. No, try. I mean, I, I mean, in the last years, I managed to get uh, my students in without problems, so I think I also participated a few years back as a, as a um, faculty in, at least in the European course, and what I've seen is, um, while there are many applicants, many don't really take much trouble in designing their project. So I guess if you really spend a few days thinking about the project you want to do, then you have a very good chance to get in any of these courses. And it's, it's really worthwhile. You learn a lot. Okay. The second part, that deals with that part of the question. Um, yes. And uh, you want to say uh, something about the first part? So yes. That, so... Uh, we are aware that uh, it would be possible, or it, maybe it would be more feasible to make uh, like first some introductory material as a web-based course and then maybe only after everybody has studied that material, collect you to meet each other for one or two days like this. And we, within the training 
committee at INCF, we've been discussing about this possibility. And uh, depending on what we decide next year, I guess, uh, or what INCF decides, it may be that we go on for this. But unfortunately, it's not available now. But INCF, uh, together with these summer schools that uh, INCF is sort of promoting and organizing, these specialized courses like uh, what David told about. So we are also producing material and sooner or later this material I think will be massively open by NCF. At least I'm preparing material yeah. from two years to be released out through NCF. So that might be an additional resource to look at. But of course it's never kind of like a bland course for you in such a way that it's various lectures from here and there and, and uh, it's maybe not the kind of full program for, to follow. Yeah. But hopefully in the future we are also able to <coughs> provide such web-based courses that would give everybody a chance to start with this field. Yes, Do the INCF portal this? is being built up as a resource for people, as you say, and the material from these courses is will be available, but is not in a nicely integrated fashion. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the conditions of our funding is that the material is made available, but you just get stuff not beautifully arranged. It'll probably a set of lectures, so you have to work, you know, it's not a beautifully tailored MOOC course, which obviously would be the ideal. So any other questions, comments? And maybe we should also mention that, uh, for example, at Coursera, there is already like one course in computational neuroscience, but that is again like relatively limited. It covers like uh, uh, one aspect of computational neuroscience, so it has very limited amount of information about uh, like uh, or uh, lectures on biophysical modeling. So it's more like uh, at the level of uh, system and cognitive level modeling, but. Uh, if anybody is interested in that, so it might be a useful course to attend. That's the COSINE, that's what C-O-S-Y-N-E, the annual computational, computational neuroscience course that's run sometimes in the States, sometimes mm. in Europe. Mm. Is that right? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yes. Okay, shall we move on to the next Yes, it's topic? about to okay. time. Is that time? Let's see. Okay, so this is about data issues. There were quite a few questions about data. Some of them overlapped and some of them were answered by Marianne in her talk. And I suppose maybe one could start um, off with the second question, which really we didn't really address, is why don't, you know, about sharing data. I mean, is there anything, Marianne or Brian, you want to say about this? Well, I can also ask if there are questions about this. So oh, sure. <clears throat> the second statement there, my experience is that these are not widely known or used, is correct. Uh, when you do an analysis of a lot of the community repositories that have been established for sharing data, they are, by and large, very underpopulated whether that's because people don't know or people um, <clears throat> do know but don't find them worth entering, it's hard to say. When we've done an analysis, we, we recently submitted a paper to, to Nature Neuroscience about this. I don't think it's fair to say that neuroscientists don't share data. Mm -hmm. They they do. <laughs> they, yes, they do. Yes. And, and in, uh, they do it under either controlled circumstances where somebody asks them and they will get the, the data, so they enter into a relationship with them. They put a lot in supplemental material, so there's a lot of information that's available in supplemental material. It's, again, not all that well formatted. It's not all that useful, but I think the intent was to make it available. Um, we find in most data sharing initiatives that there's three categories, as we like to say. <laughs> there are those who really go above and beyond uh, to share their data. And so a lot of people now are proponents of open science. They will deposit their code into open code repositories. They will deposit their data into data repositories. There are journals like the Journal of Comparative Neurology, which has now set up an um, imaging database to go with uh, JCN. There's giga science journals. There's other journals that have data repositories. Nature data, others are recommending you know, various repositories to put your data in. 
Um, and so they will go the extra mile to make sure that they deposit their data in a place where it will be openly accessible. There's a population that thinks it's stupid, a waste of time and a waste of money, and will not engage. So we tend not to bother with that population. <laughs> um, there's a large population who would like to, but don't really know how or what. Um, and there's a lot of people that are getting into the space, but again, it's not, until there are better tools, in my view, in the laboratory for appropriately managing data and getting data managed, you have to spend a lot of time and effort in most cases if you want to really make data available in a form that's useful. And so in most of the discussions that I've been um, engaged in, it always comes down to a matter of incentives. If you have X amount of time, and X amount of resources available to you, where are you going to put it? Are you going to put it in getting your data whipped into shape and making it um, accessible? Or are you going to put it someplace else? And without a good reward system for data, ability to sort of track data, a lot of these discussions just get into endless loops. Um, I think by and large, the data standards and things that have been put together is I, I would say, yes, it is true that it is not easy to share data at a deep level. It's trivial to take a file and stick it up on an FTP server. So, I mean, it really is a matter of how much time and effort you want to put into it. Generally working through the repositories, the repositories that I have seen that have been most successful are ones that have very active outreach. So they employ somebody to go and contact people, especially after they've published data, asking for the data. How many people know about Neuromorpho, the neuron reconstruction database? I thought one of the best statements I heard was one researcher who said, I finally just gave it to them so they'd stop bothering me because they were relentless in going after and requesting it. But they didn't put a lot of burden on the researchers themselves. They said, give it to us, you know, give us some experimental data, we'll go back and forth with you, we'll take care of the curation, we'll take care of the modeling. It's a relatively simple data type, you know, a, a, a tree a tree structure for a neuron. They don't have the imaging data and other things. So I think it's very dependent on type of data. It's very dependent on the individual researcher. I think the good news is, if you want to share your data, there is somebody who will take it. And even there are general repositories now, like Figshare and others, a lot of people put their data in there, it gets a DOI. If you type neuroscience in, there's thousands of things that come up uh, in response to it. Um, there's general repositories like Dryad. There's more specific repositories for neuroscience data types. I think NIF has about 400 of these. There are other places around the world that list six, 700 data repositories, community repositories that will take your data. So hopefully, um, you know, the efforts will get more coordinated and we'll start to learn and teach people better data management practices. But right now, it's hard. We don't have an incentive system. Um, there are some databases like NDAR, the National Database for Autism Research in the United States, which is run by NIH, and you will not get funding if you do not put your data in it. I mean, it's a very simple model. They have been reluctant, funders have been reluctant to put those sorts of mandates in. Um, also, the institutional repositories, the libraries are getting very much into data management and digital, digital um, the digital enterprise, mm -hmm. as Phil Byrne calls it. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of libraries are having to reinvent themselves anyway, as we sort of talked about. They are not the sort of epicenters of the campus the way they, they used to be. But they realize that their own constituents are producing digital works, and there needs to be a place to manage it. So a lot of the research libraries in the United States, at least, are positioning themselves to help scientists manage their data and to put it into a place and into a structure where it's accessible. So. So probably Um, so I come from a community where we do not just collect a lot of data, but have to design experiments where we're manipulating behavior. And one, of, one of the difficulties in sharing data is in having inadequate languages or means to describe the behavioral experiments very well. So they get described in the papers and I would say in half of them, I would defy you to try to reproduce what had been done based only on, on, only on what was written in the methods section. And this is not from a lack of intent mm. of the scientists. It's just that we do a lot of things that um, 
you know, you often don't even think about um, how you get your monkey, in our case, to work. Mm. Um, what time did your undergraduates get up this morning before they came to the session? It turns out it has frequently made a difference in the kinds of results people get in their imaging experiments. And those things are not included. And then you share your data. Someone puts a lot of time in working on it and says, I can't even reproduce mm -hmm. what you claimed you got, much less do go on and do what I wanted to do with it. The other problem that um, occurs is that with the behavioral data, the turnaround between doing the experiment and publishing is quite slow. There's a lot of exploratory stuff. You frequently have given a, presented an abstract or two at meetings and people ask you for data. And then you get in the uncomfortable position that you have a postdoctoral fellow or student, for those of you who have students, who did all this work and is trying to write this up, and someone else wants the data. And you've got to see that the student or the postdoc gets credit. And we've got to find a way in the system to be able to share credit more easily. Um, right now, it drives people into being less open than I think most people would like to be. The inability to get credit for, shared, for having share, shared something. Now, for me, it makes no difference. I'm at a stage of my career, you come and want to use some data, even if I haven't published it. If I can put my hands on it, and that's a problem also, just keeping track of data in my own lab at this point. But if I can put my hands on it, I'll give it to you if no postdoc was involved, or the postdoc has said, look, I'm never going to, I've gone, I've got my own job, I don't want to do anything with it. I'm happy to give it to you, and you can just put an acknowledgement saying you got the lab, the data from my lab. In fact, I don't want to be involved because I've got enough things I'm involved in. But I don't think we can underestimate at this point in time how important credit is, because that's how you make your career, and it's difficult. It's going to be difficult for all you young people. You have to develop a way to protect your own interests without being unpleasant and uncaring and unsharing people. And I have no easy way to tell you to do that. There will be as many adaptations to that problem um, over the next few years as there are people in this room. Um, and I don't want to scare you about it, but I don't want to minimize how important it is. Do you make a short comment? Yeah, there's a student. A student just on that. So again, it does come down to credit and attribution, which is why NIH and others are working so hard on a data citation format. Um, whether the community accepts that, again, as equal to um, Writing an article is up to the community. We always judge relative contribution. So it always does come back to credit. And I think that that's, that's evolving. And that is coming on many different community fronts and will be in place soon, which is why you should get your ORCID ID as soon as possible so that you can start to attach it. NIH and NSF are starting to allow you to list products like data sets and other things in your CV. That's what's coming in the new thing. So in, especially in NSF and NIH is going to follow suit on that. So you will be able to list the other things that you do besides um, write papers as part of your intellectual contribution. In terms of most repositories have embargo periods where you are allowed to keep it private for however long you wish. Um, usually, um, some places will let it go indefinitely. Most have a requirement that it's oh so many years before you release it. So I think that there are norms and other sorts of things that are starting to come into place that will govern the rules of data. And we have to develop those as a community. You know, when do you expose a mistake? When do you not? Do you do it collegially? All of those norms have to be developed. But I think we as the scientific community can start to develop those things. So again, credit and attribution seems to be the thing that is, is driving most of this, because why is it worth your time if you're not going to get credit? Just one interesting thing apropos of what Barry said, 
there was a big study of data sharing practices across different communities. I don't think neuroscience is one of them. But unlike what you would think, older scientists were much more willing to share their data than younger scientists for exactly this reason, because older scientists were perceived as being you know, protected somewhat from any potential negative consequences. So even though your, your generation rose up with sharing everything, in science and academia, <laughs> the tendencies are still to hoard. Uh, but also, I want to comment this thing on the, on the credit, because when, when do you need this credit? When do you need your CV? It's, it's typically when you apply for a job uh, or you apply for a grant. And, and I'm sort of uh, sometimes on these committees who decide these things, right? And I, I, when I look at, sort of look at the applicants, I, I mean, it, it really depends on who is on the panel and what they're looking for. I know for the, if I see applications from people I know have sh pro contributed code, contributed like a sharing personality, I rank them. I don't only look at, at sort of the, 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 like the high profiles and this, this. I come from physics. I think the biologists and the medical people are a little bit crazy about all these impact factors. I think it's a little bit senseless. It's very unscientific, the way they think about it, because they know it's a lot about whether you get into this journal has a lot to do with what group you are in and what is considered fashionable and who sort of, it's all this, this, this sociological effects. So I think if you have more, more, more rational people on this panel, and I think these are, they are coming, it's, I, 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 I have this, I have, I, have, I have the idea that good things come to people who share. People, who, and I think it's actually true also. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's, but I think it's, it's many of the people I know in computational neuroscience, Alad Stex is one of them, well known, he's always been sharing. And that sort of is a way to, to, to promote his work, people are using it, and sort of, I don't, I mean, so, so it's, we should try to, we shouldn't be as, as worried, I don't know, I, I like not to worry too much about the thing, just try to share, I don't know. I've never been scooped, I, I'm more worried about people not caring about what I do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is this uh, famous quote, I'm not sure who it is from, but he said basically, don't be afraid that somebody steals an idea. It's difficult enough to get it across. As from the discussion, I realized that there are a lot of tools, facilities, but uh, some researchers are ready to share as well, but there is some gap. So, but I think the main role uh, is to be played by the journals because uh, we want to publish so we follow the rules if they say this is the format I need even though I don't like I agree to them so if those journals say some rules okay if you are publishing a paper along with this you need to submit this data in this format in this and the NIA for someone collaborates with the journals so anyway I'm publishing my paper I want to publish or else I don't get rating or it is my job but whereas it's not mandatory for me to share the data. Maybe I'm a bit lazy or I'm reluctant what will happen or there is no mandatory, the main thing is. So that's why I don't tend to share, but I want to get published. So if the journals play a major role, collaborating with NIF or something, will that not create a change? Yes. The, journals do, the journals do have yes. um, things, but I have no. rules like this, but they're not enforced. No. I'm, you know, really, really eminent journals have specific rules about making your data avail available, making your paper available, etc. But in terms of sharing, these rules are not enforced. So, yeah. so that's, that's a problem. So weak mandates yeah. have been shown over and over again not to work because many have had them for a while. And why I say weak is that if there's no enforcement, because there's no way to track, there's no way, again, to determine whether somebody has complied then it's very difficult to get people to follow up. Communities where it's expected, there's a lot of peer pressure to make sure your, gene, your, your data is available, like your protein structure will be in the PDB and those sorts of things. So generally, it's been successful where there's a strong advocate and when there's a mechanism to track compliance, then it'll happen. Now, there are some trends that are happening now. So recently also, though, if you didn't follow it, the PLOS computational biology saying that you were going to share your data. There was a lot of hostility that came out of that. Um, if you uh, Google PLOS fail, you'll see some very interesting discussions about what people think about being made to share their data. 
But there are data papers and data journals that are coming out where, again, as part of the publication process, you are expected to make your data available. They also are accepting these data papers, which are just descriptions of the data set. So there's no analysis necessarily. There's no conclusions. It's just a deep characterization of the data, and the data are expected to be put into a, an approved repository. So it's a good idea, but this is one of the reasons, again, why we're working so hard on a system of tracking data. Because once you have that, then when they say, I published my paper, they have to provide a number that says, I have, in fact, put my data in here. And it is, it, it is instantaneous for someone to check whether they have done so. But let me tell you one very funny uh, <laughs> anecdote. There was a data sharing project by the US National Science Foundation, where as a condition of funding, you had to put your data in a repository. And one of the women who ran the repository told me of one researcher who put his data in, in compliance, and then promptly took it right back out again and wouldn't leave it there. And NSF didn't do a thing about it. <laughs> so, so it's a good idea, but these things still need an incentive system, I think, more than stick. <laughs> I think it's so, part of the biographics yeah. yeah. of building a relationship. But, you know, you have, you go to somebody and you ask them, please could I, you know, have, I'm interested in your data, I wonder whether you will share it with me. They might say, well, why? And so, I mean, maybe there's some benefit for them as well as you. Not, you're, you're not just a parasite, you know, you're, you're, there's some reason why you want to do this. And then maybe you can develop a relationship. Develop your relationship in my way is the best way forward. And I, had a, I had a great relationship with a guy called Jun Hao Kang from Northwestern. He gave me his data immediately. Um, and in fact, the paper I published in the Journal of Neuroscience recently actually contradicts his findings, and his own findings in some ways, but he's really happy for me to do that. So, so that's, that's a great test of somebody who's, who's willing and able through developing a relationship with him that to, it was successful. So, so I the data sharing issue and it's time to move to the third set of questions. Okay. This is a slightly different um, set of questions which the questions is which has to do with dynamics of circuitry. Dynamical aspects in various ways. We've talked, you know, about structural stuff and physiological re relationships of structure, but now um, it's a question of dynamics. And um, I put my name up there because I wanted to um, mention one particular thing. Um, Should we leave like one minute for everybody to read it through? So one minute, and yep. you read it through. Good idea. Okay. Am I? Should I use this microphone or the other microphone? I'm okay. Okay, right. Okay. So. Um, uh, okay. I just wanted to mention one particular point, which was to do with uh, the dynamics of neural circuitry. Um, I want to mention that. One thing we haven't talked about in great deal here are the clinical aspects of neuroinformatics. And there's one particular area which I know certainly in the UK is very popular amongst experimental neuroscientists and also amongst the modeling community, and that is trying to understand the source of Parkinsonism, which involves oscillatory activity within the structure of the brain, the basal ganglia. And so there's a whole lot of scope there for understanding, um, firstly, the actual the circuitry and also the responses, but also to understand, develop models for why this particular set of structures suddenly goes off into a Parkinsonian state. And um, I was reading a um, strategy document from the Medical Research Council of the UK, and um, they had various topics they were interested in. One of them was dynamics of neural circuitry. And I couldn't work out why that was there. And of course, I realize now it's because um, that is one particular um, condition that people are very interested in understanding these days. And this is some Parkinsonism, I think, is becoming more prevalent um, 
in the community at large. So um, this is just one aspect where um, modeling techniques and experimental te <coughs> techniques can come together. So I just wanted to mention that as, and you know, one can approach that through both aspects. So Gauta, do you want to say something about the dynamics? Uh, I, was, yeah. I was rather going to say something about point two because sure, I think okay. that's easier, if that's fine. Okay. Yeah, so, so it's about these measurement techniques. And, and of course, it, it's, it's really true that, uh, I mean, it's really measurements, the kind of measurements you can do really it, it determines what kind of science you can do. It's often measurements leads theory in that sense. So it's, it's very important to get, uh, get the best measurements you can of, of neural activity. And when you talk about uh, active measuring activity at sort of like in the, in the, say inside the cortex, inside the brain, like activity in circuits on like millimeter scale, then it's really just two principles that nature has to offer. So I'm offer. I mean, it's uh, meaning in terms of like the basic laws of physics. And one is measuring the electrical potentials. Uh, and the electrical potentials are measured with electrodes. Uh, and a problem with it, there's, um, and yeah, so the one thing is there's a limit to how the, the spatial resolution uh, is limited to essentially the size of the electrode contact. Uh, the metal part of the electrode, say, which is maybe then we can get down to one, one micrometer. A problem though is that you have to, uh, you have to have a way to 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 get the electrode contact down. You need like the shaft, and uh, and so if you have if you want to measure many places at the same time, you just destroy the tissue you're going through. It's just like a very very tight needle pad. So that's sort of like the limitation on how much you can really uh, record, uh, record from. Also, you need to get the signals out, which typically is then they also require leads. So there are these, this is like one of fundamental limitation. The other way to, to do it is, is by optics. And then you don't need, well, you obviously don't need electrodes and you don't need leads because you shine in light from the outside and then you wait for reflections coming out from your neural tissue. Uh, the, the problem there is that the light, when it goes through neural tissue, it scatters, so you lose focus. But then you can do this trick uh, with this, we have two, two, uh, two light sources so that you get this two photon uh, technique where you get a much higher resolution. You have essentially two light beams, uh, light beams crossing and uh, it's only in where they cross that you get the excitation of the, of the neural tissue. So you get to actually activate a very, very small part, maybe down to one one micrometer. Uh, a problem there is that you need a special kind of ink molecule inside the, inside the, the, inside the neuron. And at the moment, and you need something that, that the ink molecule responds differently depending on activity. And at the moment you have these markers for calcium, so you can measure the calcium concentration. And uh, which is sort of cool, but, uh, but uh, the limiting, that the calcium is sort of the slow part of the neural activation. It lasts for hundreds of milliseconds, so it's it's difficult. You don't really have the res the, the the temporal resolution that you would like. Uh, so, uh, but then people are looking for other ink molecules essentially. Um, so you could get sort of like instead of calcium, if you could measure sodium, that would be better because it, in principle at least, because then you could sort of uh, uh, get the better uh, time resolution. So I think that there's lots of and, and yeah. So that's so there are these fundamental uh, I would say like physics limitations. But there are also these new developments where people have, because there's one way to, to increase the resolution is to not only measure from a smaller volume, if you can also activate the smaller volume. And that they can do with this optogenetics. There's different kind of, these particular ion channels that you can inject in, which you can then activate by light. Uh, so there's sort of all kinds of clever trickery which is being developed so that you can increase both, I mean, increase the spatial resolution. But I don't really see how, how you can, I mean, there's, there's not much, else in terms of natural forces to take advantage of, uh, I think. So, uh, so yeah, so that's, uh, so there's this quite a breakthrough technology. I don't really know, but uh, yeah, there are, there are these, there, there are these, these limits, but people are also clever. So they come up with really clever things, so. Just to follow up on what Gaut is saying about technology, probably the area that's moving, that 
Well, the American Brain Project is supposed to be emphasizing technology. One of the technologies they want to emphasize is multiple electrodes, better technologies, nanotechnologies. The other are the molecular techniques, and I want to just broaden that because while the optical, the so-called optogenetic techniques are very attractive because of the speed with which they work, in big-brained animals, the amount of tissue you can manipulate with them are small. But there are some techniques coming along where if you can control the tissue that has the material in it, you can activate with chemical uh, means, which means you don't need to get the activating material precisely located. Um, I think, in the long run, these are going to be a wonderful toolbox of techniques. Um, they are very hard to work with, having spent six years in an unseemly amount of money on it uh, for some of this. I can tell you they're unbelievably difficult to work with. But they move along slow, they, they are moving along slowly, and the young people in this room or in the generation who are going to be able to take advantage of these techniques. So either get involved with people trying to apply them with the understanding that you better have another project to do also, because they're going so slowly, even you guys will get older while they move along. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and the, or at least keep a close eye on them so that you'll be in a position to move over and start taking advantage of the tools as they develop. Um, let me just say another thing, and that is the dynamics. We all pay lip service that, to the dynamics, and the brain is a dynamical time domain system. We behave through time and space. And um, up till now, the amount of effort that has gone into really doing dynamics in the brain and understanding how signals evolve over time has really not been emphasized. And it's another area that I think is a growth area in neuroscience right now and in neuroinformatics because the, the amount of data that it's going to take to deal with the dynamics is going to be very large, but I think it's a place that's, it's something that's coming in the near future. This may get there before the molecular techniques, because you can certainly put sets of electrodes in a couple of places in the brain where you know there are connections and try to analyze the relation between signals over time. So before we give uh, time to students to ask, I, I want to point out also one fact. So I, see, I don't see myself like how to point it out that there would be any fancy techniques coming uh, really soon, but I see that it's more the combination of electrical and optical techniques. So what I figured out uh, during the last year is actually that with the electrical techniques, with electrodes, you uh, impose uh, certain swelling effects in, in your system. We all know that. But it now seems that, uh, for example, uh, when studying synaptic plasticity, the results may change depending which technique you've been using. And it will be crucial uh, to combine techniques, to look at the, how things are with optical techniques as well, not only with electrodes. And I don't want to go into details, but I just want to mention this. Uh, then the next question is there. Uh, I know uh, biology, uh, biology systems for bi uh, biology and in uh, neuroinformatics, could I say that is similar with uh, in the electrical point of view uh, neuroscience systems or it's, it exists a very big difference between these two subjects, as I say? Is, uh, there a, is there a difference between... I try to do a comparison between mm -hmm. biology and neuroscience, and I don't know how to fit uh, biology, syst biology systems, how to run it, but in neuroscience. It, it will be 
las de homólogo son on neuroscience biology systems in neuroscience systems well i mean you might say neuroscience you could say neuroscience is part of bi biology biology is a big subject uh -huh. um, were you thinking of what sort of biological systems were you thinking of are you have you been working on uh, biology systems i know that uh, uh, they study nodes, ages, and they do models, map models about maybe gen reg regulatory genes, uh, and right. these this kind of things. I have seen here also nodes, ages, but all rela uh, relation between neurons. Right, okay. Uh -huh. um, I suppose most, that's a very good question, because most of, you might say, traditional neuroinformatics, if you can say that, has been, you start out at, like the element the important element is the nerve cell and the synapses between the connections between them. But as you say, well, down below that or are all the components from genes up to proteins, mm -hmm. up to genes making proteins, protein making cells. And generally speaking, um, most <coughs> models, most analysis in neuroinformatics is from around the cellular level upwards, as it were, However, um, this is something that's going to change. I mean, the, um, it's, the problem is at the um, computational neuroscience level, as it were, that we've talked about here, one can write down equations for compartmental models of the neuron and how they interact with each other, and one can understand this quite well. Then the question is how to write down equations for all the proteins that are getting together to make the cells that come together to make the synapses, sorry, make the uh, proteins come together to make the cells, make the synapses, et cetera. Um, this is something that we might say is more complex. Uh, one doesn't know how these systems are controlled, how the genes control the proteins. In the end, one's going to have to make very strong assumptions about what's, you know, you know, one can't write down a great big equation about everything. You know, you have to sort of somehow um, make some strong assumptions about what is the important element. So um, I suppose this is something that uh, hopefully, as more information about particular cellular pathways co becomes available, then we one will be able to um, incorporate subcellular parts components in one structure itself. So it's, you know, it's a different level, but mm. something that has to be taken care of. I can also comment on that. I, I briefly mentioned it in my, my lecture also that I think now there's all these uh, studies where they look at these GWA studies, genome-wide association studies, they look at the genes of people and groups of people and they see what are different uh, statistically between these, the genes of this group of people compared to that group of people. And then, of course, uh, they hope maybe that more of the features or the diseases that they were interested in were just tied to a very few genes, one or two genes maybe. But it turns out that the, typically they're not. They are tied to many genes. So it's very polygenic, meaning that maybe, like I mentioned yesterday, they now identified 100 genes correlated to whether you have schizophrenia or not. So it's just impossible to start making mice models which turn on and off one of these genes and sort of try to do it the experimental way. So that's why uh, we, I mean, we are also involved in a collaboration with one person in the Schizophrenia Consortium We have started to model these effects that they see, these hits, in, in, in models because then we can study everything at the same time. So, but, so I think I think I think one of the re one of the way that one of the well directions that neuroinformatics and particularly computational neuroscience also then is going is into getting more molecular because then it gets more information about what is important also from these gene studies and I also think that after when they've sort of found find, done all these gene studies they'll sort of these, these, the people who do work on the gene say that this is not going to work we have to do something else and I think they they have to turn to neuroinformatics to to start making sense of this data they, they get. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> regarding what you said earlier, uh, so being having, a, having tips that have, uh, I guess, five microns, somewhere between five and 15 microns, 
how much damage can we really do to the cortex? I, I would assume it would just go through easily. Yeah. So without. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think I think I, my well, I, at least they have these special techniques of injecting these electrodes and uh, and where they do it in like the particular kind of uh, well jerky way. Uh, and and I have the feeling that that uh, that often they that actually they then it's, they do maybe less damage than you might think. But there are also some long term issues. I know that when the electrodes are in for a long time, which you would like maybe in patients, that they start getting this dead layer around the electrodes or these biofilms. But there are also other ways to build electrodes where they actually in case you need to be sharp to put it into the brain. But when they're in the brain, they can sort of you don't doesn't need to be I mean sharp. You need to have to be stiff to get into the brain. So I know that people are making these electrodes which are covered by sugar or something, so that when it is down in the brain, actually the sugar melts away and the, and the electrode sort of gets, gets just like, like, like little springs, sort of gets out. So, so there's all these different techniques also where, they, where, where people are working on, on better electrodes, also in terms of long-term use and less damage for the brain. Yeah, and I wanted to still mention that it's not only the damage that it starts to the neurons, but it's also the damage that it does to the other neuronal other neural components, which tends change the how the the way how neurons behave. But it's a it's a it's a uh, bigger topic. And now we move on to the next ne next question. I think this, this actually does actually relate to the question about the biological systems. Um, just now that we had, and I'll read you this, if I can, I'll read it on here because I can't read the glasses. Um, so the first question is, um, recent developments in biologically inspired neural networks seem to capture some of the cognitive capabilities of the brain, despite ignoring a substantial amount of biological detail. How should we look at the possibility that these algorithms already replicate many of the mechanisms that are relevant cognition and that we might be overemphasizing the importance of cellular and molecular detail. So that's one question. Um, the other question is, there are a variety of tools available for carrying out detailed simulations at the neural level. How much exactly is left out, not only in terms of brain structure, but also in terms of detail? Could these missing parts play a role in cognitive processes? And what are the plans, if any, to include them in future simulations? So, I, I take those as, con as questions which have two different opposite views. One is that at, if you want to understand, say, how we function, you, need to, you don't need to look at the detail. The other question is, um, well, you do need to look at the detail. And this implies, I say it's related to the biological question, because then going down a bit further, how much do you need to know about the molecular level to understand nerve cell activity and so on. But I think the answer is one needs, my, my answer is that one needs to know, you know about information, one needs to have information at every different level. And then the question is, does it then turn out that certain aspects at a particular lower level for understanding a high level function are, ne are not necessary? And you can only do that by working out, developing models at different levels and find that some details aren't necessary. So this is a question, anyway, so it's an issue about how much level do you, you need for understanding, level of detail do you need for understanding? And I think people have already asked that, answered that question saying, well, it depends on the question you're answering or you're asking and trying to get an answer for. So that's my thought introduction onto that thing. Marlene, do you want to say something yeah, about this? Yeah, so maybe, maybe I mentioned, uh, like, uh, there are different approaches already existing in the world. So there is this approach by uh, Professor Chris Elias Smith, who is developing this uh, Nengo simulator to, to kind of model the cognitive uh, uh, processes, like what is emphasized here. And it is true that they are able to, uh, to very nicely produce some cognitive uh, phenomena and, and some behavior, but then at the end I would be asking that uh, I don't think it, they have shown anything related to plasticity and how you learn and how you kind of, uh, uh, like if you think about human and, and even rats and mice, like how they can survive in very unexpected 
circumstances. So then you can you can always ask that the, that the, whether this is enough what we can is is really nice and it's an important step. But at the end, like uh, since we don't know which is producing this very plastic uh, behavior that we are able to manage that we are able to manage in this world. So. I think we still have to look at all the details as well, but at the end it might be that, like David pointed out, it may be that at each level of detail like molecular, cellular, network and so on, we just pick up those details that are crucial for, for the question that we are asking. But for sure when we are trying to understand diseases, I, I think they don't arise, or certain aspects of them arise at the dynamic level, but the, the, the starting point is somewhere molecular, cellular, I'm sure for that. So for that reason, we at least have to look at the details. There was a subject called, well, there is a subject called artificial neural networks, which was around in the 1980s, mid 1980s onwards. And there were people, if you don't know about it, people um, developed very stylized models of the brain in terms of, which was in simulation usually, in terms of little units, processing units, having connections to other processing units. They worked in parallel. And there was a lot of claims about how these networks replicated cognitive functions. So therefore, these were artificial neural networks. So they had the capabilities of the brain and they were wonderful things. And of course, this is not quite right. I, I mention that because um, deep neural networks are really just are modern versions of these some of these neural networks. So, so there was an example. Uh, there was a case where, you know, you could. It was thought that one could abstract um, with abstract models understand cognition. But then, I think the view now is that this wasn't quite. It was a bit of hype, basically, to get lots of money. And so, this was a topic that went around for twenty years or so, and it's um, evolved in another direction, machine learning. But it's, but it was there. So anyway. And may I, maybe I still want to add like one example, uh, how I myself, for example, think that we need to look at the details. So when I, for example, look at the models for synaptic plasticity and trying to sort of produce some sort of uh, at least short term plasticity in neural networks, there are nice equations that you can plug into your system just one or two equations. But then at the end, when you really start looking at it in detail, there are many regulatory and modul modulatory systems and many mechanisms that sort of the more you go to longer term, that regulate the system. And you start wondering whether they should be taken into account somehow. And now they are not taken into account at all. And they go to really deep molecular level and not only interactions between neurons, but other elements in the brain. So it's cl clear to me that you have to also look at the, the details, but of course some of us will continue doing the more, the more the kind of system and cognitive level and maybe like for engineering purposes, like we had the presentation today by, by, by one of the our Lish, 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 Lish. <laughs> yes. Lish. And then maybe you first and then Mark Oliver. Yes. Yes. It's almost yeah. irrelevant now because it was okay. a comment to what yes. you said before <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so I, I know a bit about the deep neural network field. So um, in many cases, the deep networks are used to solve a particular problem. But if you're trying to build a machine, say, that has a capability of doing many different tasks, then it's not clear yet how the, the deep networks should be um, combined together so that you can actually create an organism that can interact with the world. I mean, usually these networks are sitting inside a box. And then you ask them to classify images or classify audio. But it's not the same thing as now that I've classified it, well, how do I use it to understand my world so I can act appropriately on it? And so, so there's still a lot of stuff to be understood. Even um, the Nengo framework that you mentioned, the, the spawn network, right? So that has um, no learning capabilities, right? So in some sense, it's, it's constructed. So it can perform a set of uh, cognitive tasks but um, there's no plasticity that was embedded in the system so that if something changes, then how is this network now going to, say, learn new digits or uh, corrupted forms of the digit that it never learned before, and how is it going to still perform the proper you know, behavior? 
Yeah, maybe maybe I say it <laughs> anyway. So um, the way the way I see it, so so David nicely said that there was this field of neural networks, and I think now we can just subsume it under machine learning. And deep learning is, I think, an extension of Boltzmann machines, which were around in the 80s. And these are basically distillations of neural principles, but um, there is no way backwards. So if you do something with them, it's, you can't really go back to a neural correlate. And uh, without wanting to do injustice to Spawn and Elias Smith's work, what this really is, is you take, a, you take a machine learning network, and then there's a compiler that turns it into a spiking network. It's basically what I see a cosmetic tool to make a machine learning application look a little bit more biological, a little bit more realistic. And this is really what it is in my opinion, because uh, the other way around it doesn't work, which means if you have a network which is, which is, or, yeah, which is reconstructing a biological substrate that is a piece of brain tissue in some way, then there is no way you can Nangoize it. Yeah, it's, it's because Nango assumes that you, you have a set of, of linear operations. These you can then translate automatically into a corresponding spiking network. And that's why it's called neural engineering framework. There was a similar thing around in the 90s, 80s called NSL. A neural simulation language, which was effectively a library. So things of this sort have been around, and yeah. We, so the, the, the short summary of this long story is you can distill some principles about plasticity and about learning, but whenever you really want to use them to understand what is happening in the brain, they fail. The best example, in my view, is reinforcement learning, which I think many believe is underlying any type of action learning in the end. But if you look at how fast we can learn anything where there is sufficient amount of reward involved, be it money, be it sex, be it food, um, and compare that to any network, there are orders of magnitude difference between any agent that has to learn a non-trivial problem and any human that has to learn a non-trivial problem. It's, it's really several orders of magnitudes of, of repetitions that any agent will need in order to f even solve the simplest thing that, that we learn in one or two trials. <laughs> uh, uh, well, since you started talking about these deep, deep networks, because they might not be like the, the brain, but uh, it just remind me that actually one of my Previous students or previous students from a lab started a company now in, in Silicon Valley where he wants to use deep, deep brain networks uh, for, uh, for really investigating like big data and so on. So even though they're not useful for understanding the brain, they are sort of useful for maybe, it's actually called Nirvana, this company. So that's a sort of a Nirvana with an E and not an I. But, but anyway, but, so, so, but I think also since, since we are discussing about this, this thing of companies, because uh, there's, every year, this is computational neuroscience meeting. Computational neuroscience is a, is a section of, uh, of, of neuro, a part of neuroinformatics. And then they had this career night for young researchers. And uh, at least a couple of years ago, then there was there, there were these people from from the brain systems, some, some kind of company in San Diego, who is a subsidiary of, of Qualcomm, which is this huge chip company. So they are hiring neuroinformaticians. To, to try to implement some of their like the neural codes into 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 chips and the, the the basic idea is that they want to have chips in they want to make the internet of things they want to have like little chips attached to all kinds of devices so that they can communicate have smart houses and smart all kinds of things and that a key thing there is really to have low low power so there's also like these other I think other I'm not quite how how successful this will be but at least they are investing a lot of well, at least money into money into hiring people to explore these things. So there's many. There are also job opportunities outside, outside academia. Let's take some student questions. Now. Okay. So it, you talk about the deep neural networks, and uh, you just. But uh, what about the other one? The second case, uh, hierarchical temporal memory. 
which as far as I know is slightly different because it, it does add some biological detail. Well, not, I wouldn't say biological detail, but maybe it's more similar. Yeah, again, I mean, that's why I use the word uh, machine learning. These are all machine learning techniques, and they use some biological principles. Mm -hmm. But it is, you know, it's like, it's like with a model of flying. A bird and an airplane, they both use some ways to, to create an upward force, but that's about as far as the, the uh, capability or the similarity goes. The, the, the problem is it's, it's a one-way abstraction away from biology. That is, if you, you can learn... You can, so these things have been used to learn about information processing from the brain but it doesn't work the other way around. You cannot use this tool to learn anything about information processing in the brain. You could say the same thing about spiking neural networks in a sense. It's just one step closer to... No, the question is whether you still have something left that you can measure. Yeah? So any model depends on the observables that you have. If your system doesn't have any observables anymore that you have in, in, in both systems, then you cannot compare them anymore. Mm -hmm. If you find these observables, then, of course, at that level, you can compare them. You do have them in hierarchical temporal memory. You have the number of, because it, there is some plasticity there, the number of synapses, so it replicates the, or the cortical columns. Uh, the, you have something called the potential synapses. And then it decides. Can you measure potential synapses in the brain? No, yeah, some, the, so the, the, the architecture is something called potential synapses, which dynamically decides, basically, are the cortical columns are connected to each other? It then cuts or adds, yeah. and you can, you can, you could do a statistical analysis on this. See how much it decides to connect to uh, to uh, other cortical columns, depending on the the stimulus that you're presenting. Uh, so there is some something that you can get out of that that might tell you something about the brain. Maybe less than spiking neural networks, but then again, it's just a spectrum. <clears throat> if I was, if I was Memory. I don't actually know exactly what that is, but I mean, presumably what I would do is I would test it out against <coughs> cognitive functions that it's supposed to replicate, and then I'll be looking at the elements of it and say, um, what, what elements in that model correspond to what elements in the brain? So how are the computations done? You mentioned reinforcement learning there. You know, it's a question of similar case, you know, you have these in these models, they have to do, in some cases, quite complicated computations. And so how is a synapse or whatever or a nerve cell going to do this computation? So I would be looking at those sort of aspects, how the, what the, you know, what phenomenon it accounts for and how it's, what's the implementation. Um, of course, it might do s quite well, but then the question is, it's not how the brain's doing it. You, even, even if it failed the second test, you know, you can, it does quite well, but in fact, the, the, um, the implementation isn't there. Obviously, it, do, it replicates what the brain does, but it doesn't do exactly what the brain does because the correspondence isn't there. So, yeah, yeah, I, I was, yes, I was yes. about to say the yes. same thing. So you can compare them at a performance level, but since the one is not a mechanistic model of the other one, you can't compare the components anymore. So the relation to the original yes. substrate is lost, and that's so, the, the so problem that you have. Okay. No, some, some so it, it could some it. it could give you ideas though. Yeah. yeah. So there are two parts of this. One is I agree that you don't learn much about the brain by studying uh, how the brain implements something by studying uh, an artificial neural network. You have no idea whether it's implementing the same uh, solution. Uh, probably the best example of that is the computers that beat the best chess players in the world. I don't find it particularly interesting that they do that because it's obvious they're doing it through this comprehensive search mechanism that is nothing like the strategy that a chess master uses, not even close. We don't understand what the chess masters do, but we do know they prune the tree in a way that these computer algorithms don't even come close to doing, because they look at the board and they, they know there are certain things they shouldn't chase, and they don't. The other side of the coin is to look for things that are principled and 
perhaps a great example, an example to me of that, where you learn something about principle, is look for different species of animals that solve what appears to be the same problem using different ways of doing it. And one of the comparisons that actually was always neat for me to think about was electric fish who use their electric field as a sensory device. So these are fish that live in muddy rivers. And they exist in both the, the um, old world and the new world. But interestingly enough, one, and I can never keep track of which is which, one of them solves it in the frequency domain. And they have sensors on only the head and the tail. And if you record from the neurons, they're, they feel disturbances in the phase relationship of the electric field when it's disturbed. The neurons are sensitive to the phase relations. The other class does it in the time domain. And those animals have a row of sensors going the whole length of the body at quite closely matched spacings. And they're measuring the time differences between the, um, the electric field disturbances at the different sensors. And it's interesting because that is, they've solved exactly the same problem, but using two different principle, physical principles that we understand. And you can see the reflection of it in the neuronal system. So if you can be really clever about the systems you choose to study, you can learn a lot of really nice things about the nervous system. Are there any more questions or comments on this topic? Yeah. Mm. Um, so a lot of the last comments were about um, whether we can learn something about the brain from these artificial neural networks used in deep learning and so on. My question is a little bit in the other direction. Can uh, artificial neural networks um, benefit from some of the biological details of neurons if you uh, were integrating them into artificial neural networks? Parallelism. So I shared an example of, of how um, we had a new computation primitive, which is the winner take all. And that would never have come out if we didn't have this anatomy and connectivity of you know, the different types of neurons in the cortex. Yeah. But, I mean, not, not for a standard proposal, but just, just for general learning kind of thing, like what they're doing in, in deep learning uh, and machine learning. I, so I. Are you asking where these computational primitives are used? The ones that are created because of the information that you get from the nervous system? Maybe, just like, um, Maybe Mark, Mark is ready to answer. Yeah, so I think the first is to realize that, that this, this deep learning is nothing but an abstraction that has been made in the 1940s from the brain. Yeah, so it already has benefited. Um, that's the first answer. The other point is that since then, we have learned a lot of things about how connections work and how plasticity works. And that hasn't really found um, its way into the machine learning community. Some of it does. I mean, reinforcement learning is a good example, which exists in, or which finds its way into, into robotics as a way to learn by imitation and by example. But many things are not understood currently. And... Um, it, it takes a lot of time. So, so deep learning in my way, so at least the, the Google paper, the, the, the way I've read it is basically you apply the computation power of Google to an algorithm that was already there. Um, what is difficult is that these things are unsupervised learning algorithms. So they will learn something, but you don't really know what they learn. Yeah? And whereas in, if, you, if you look at what happens in, in animals, you have this distinction between supervised and unsupervised learning. Supervised learning, uh, unsupervised learning is mostly 
interesting during development when you basically set up your visual system, but later when you go to school and when you, when you learn from experience, it's basically some sort of supervised learning that you have either self-supervised, that would be reinforcement learning. Yeah, so if you do something and you get a reward in what form, however, then you <coughs> do it even better the next time. Or somebody explicitly tells you to learn something, you can memorize it immediately. Yeah, and these things are really poorly understood. Yeah, so the Google system learned cats, but would they be able to learn, I don't know, cars if they wanted to, particular cars if they wanted to? I mean, this is still very, very hard to do. And there, of course, uh, any machine learning is, they are still looking into, into the mechanisms that you have in the brain. And uh, it's, it's, an, it's an open field. And as I, as I mentioned, if you look into reinforcement learning, the algorithms currently need 10,000 to 100,000 of trials to learn the tr most trivial task, whereas we do it in two or three or five trials. And that is completely not understood. About um, 20, 25 years ago, Jeff Hinton, who is one of the big machine learning Google people who has developed many of the neural network algorithms, commented that the, the existing neural networks at that time were had the brain of a slug, or rather he said half a slug. So I suspect he would actually update that to a little bit more than a slug, but certainly there's a long way to go for a deep learning algorithm, uh, for existing algorithms to come to the capabilities that we have. Very good on particular tasks, but not as a general purpose system. That's, that's my view anyway. So, Is there any, I mean, we, I think we, we're gonna close very shortly. Is there anything any other, any other burning question, burning question, that you need to have answered right now? So, it's just that when somebody is interested to enter neuroscience or something, uh, one sees a lot of fields: computational neuroscience, mathematical neuroscience, system neuroscience. Like, but most of them overlap, but like how do they differentiate or maybe if you can give the ontology of these branches or uh, like is there how, how it works usually because it's very confusing if somebody wants to enter, what course should I do, what is the field actually? Three terms there, but that probably won't help you in general. I mean, systems neuroscience is a subject studied by experimental neuroscientists um, and computer and and pe people who um, write programs about um, to model systems. Um, computational neuroscientists tend to use the techniques of computer modeling. Mathematical neuroscientists tend to try and prove theorems about um, how the brain works, which may or may not be also backed up by um, simulation systems. But those are just three terms. and there are, I don't know of any other ontology apart from that. I'm, Mark, it looks as though you're raised to. Yeah, you have answered that. Yes. So. Yeah. Um, I think once you read some papers, or there are, you know, ones quite often one sees, say, in in um, Nature Neuroscience Review, you know, say review journals, one finds introductory topics to these various areas. Mathematical neuroscience, I can say that there's a journal called the Journal of Mathematical Neuroscience, which has come out from a lab in, in Nottingham in, in the UK. So you, by reading some of those papers, you can see the sort of, or trying to understand some of the papers, you will see the sort of things they deal with. So I think it's a question of trying to, in this respect, when there are no ontologies available, looking to see the sort of topics they cover. Um, but I agree, it's sometimes for the newcomer, it's difficult to disambiguate the various terms. I'm sorry? Parkinson's model. Parkinson's model. HH model. Parkinson's model. Ah, What would that be? That would be a model, it, you would say that's computational neuroscience, one would say. It's like, it would say mathematical level that coming with mathematical proofs representing. So at some point, like, there's a lot of overlap. Sure, absolutely. I mean, the. You might say, as somebody, one of the talk presenters did say, that there's, it's a mathematical model. Um, 
many mathematical models don't, may not have attention to the mapping their elements of their mathematical system into the underlying biological systems. And Hodgkin Huxley went sort of halfway there. So it's a sort of mathematical stroke computational neuroscience model, I suppose. And he did, they did computations, because they, they had a hand calculator that they, they wound and got numbers out of it, which is their simulation. In this yeah, case. yesterday, sir, has showed one uh, slide that yeah. computational model is one model from the mathematical model. So yeah. the equations yeah. are yeah. just modeled using yeah. algorithm, yeah. nothing yeah. else. I think we should finish the discussion there. Um, what I was going to say that as a final remark is that we haven't been able to cover all the questions. Some of the questions that you posed um, have been answered in the talks, but some of them maybe not. But I would suggest that if you have questions you want to follow up, you should mail us. I mean, in the spirit of um, share, us sharing our knowledge with you, I hope we will all be receptive to answering your questions. So, so if you have, if for example, you've been to a talk where there's a particular top point you didn't understand, mail, this, mail the instructor and ask them. So that's probably a first point of clarification of all the things that we couldn't um, address, because we know that there are lots of things we couldn't address. So that's, I think, um, the end of this session. Thank you very much. We have a final talk. So um, Gauti is going to wrap up the proceedings. Thank you.